All right, hello there. We have finally made it. This is this is the conclusion. This is it for a fresh look at Mere Christianity. Um, if you've watched the whole thing, kudos to you. And I'd really love to hear it if you did, because um, I've had a blast doing this. Like I just this has been awesome. Um, the book is the book is a classic for sure. And um, so. <clears throat> All right, what I want to do for conclusion here, um, really what I want to do is I really just want to share my heart with you. I mean, I just want to just kind of put some things out there, um, hopefully that will help you, inspire you, um, and um, if, if the book hasn't um, brought you to Christ yet, then I'm going to try to put an exclamation point on here. Um, to this, the, my whole part of this, obviously the, you know, C.S. Lewis and his work and this book stands alone and stands on its own. Um, but uh, I want to talk to you about mystery just for a few minutes. I just want to kind of take all my thoughts and um, I got a few scriptures I want to share here, but I basically want to um, talk to you about mystery. And when I say mystery, I don't mean um, I don't mean like a like a murder mystery or anything like that. I mean I mean mystery as it specifically relates to God Himself. Okay, um, because there's always going to be a mystery to God. Okay, so I've been a Christian for 47 years. I just turned 54 in June. It's August of 2020. Um, and so I've been a Christian for pretty much my whole life, okay? Got saved when I was seven years old. Um, I just, you know, I was, I was seven years old, and I, I saw God in my parents. I heard the gospel, which simply means the good news about Jesus and what he did. Um, and I knew I needed it. I knew I was a sinner, um, and I knew that I needed to get right with God. And so in my seven-year-old innocence in my heart, I just did that. I just asked the Lord to forgive me. I gave my heart to Christ. And, um, and I've never regretted that decision ever in my whole life. Um, but the reality is there's a mystery to God. No matter how much you know Him, there's always a mystery to God. So what I want to do is I want to ask you this question. Okay? When it comes to God, regardless of where you're at, okay, how comfortable are you with mystery how comfortable are you with mystery cuz 47 years into this if you're not comfortable with mystery you're gonna have a really hard time okay it's just gonna be hard it's just you know um, and so here's what I want us to do and I apologize you probably won't when I looked at this you may not be able to see it but that actually says embracing the mystery of God I apologize I'm not sure where the glare was but I want to try and help us embrace the mystery of God um, those of us who are Christians and those of us who aren't Christians you know I, um, I mean in in the bottom of my heart I've really done this in the hopes that one person would come to Christ as a result of it Hundreds of people, maybe even thousands of people, have come to Christ as a result of Lewis's book. But my taking a fresh look here is really my attempt and hope that somebody will find Christ through it. Um, so that is my 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 hope. Unapologetically, I hope that. But that's between you and God. Okay. Um, but I want to help us embrace the mystery of God because there's always going to be that mystery. I want to just look at a few scriptures here, um, and then that'll be it. I'm going to share a couple stories, and uh, but I won't. I'm going to try to keep this less than 30 minutes. So, in uh, Mark chapter four, um, and I just sat down this morning and just looked up some verses and just kind of uh, prayed for direction on how to conclude this. Mark chapter four, Jesus said this. It says he was saying to them, "This is Jesus in red here." To you who have been, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. To you, talking to his disciples, 
has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. Okay? There's a mystery to it, man. <laughs> okay? There's a mystery. The, the, the supernatural world, God and who He is, and even as actively involved as He is in humanity, there is a mystery to it. Okay? There's always going to be. We're never going to get rid of the mystery entirely on this side. Um, he said, it's been given to you, but to those who are on the outside, get everything in parables. So that while seeing, they may not see and not perceive. And while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. I read that verse this morning and I thought, Lord, what's up with that? Don't you want them to return and be forgiven? That's a really good question. But Jesus said, listen, to you, talking to his disciples, you've been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But those who are outside get everything in parables. Now, what's he talking about? Okay. Now, Jesus, when he was here, most of how he taught was parables. He did teach some other things, but he used parables. Why? So a parable, what's a parable? A biblical parable. Okay, A biblical parable is simply a story. It could be a simple story about seeds. Jesus taught about seeds. You plant seeds in a garden, seeds in the ground. He taught, told parables about um, a lost coin, about a lost son. Lots of different parables. But they were just regular, natural stories about everyday things. That's a parable. A regular, natural story about everyday things. So you could listen to the story and hear about the seeds that go in the ground and not understand, not perceive, or understand the principle or the thing that Jesus was teaching, which was a spiritual uh, principle or something that was is spiritual revealed in that same story. Does that make sense? I hope I was clear with that. So in other words, a parable was a natural story just about something simple. And you could understand the story about the natural part, but not understand that what Jesus was talking about was not just the natural. He was talking about the spiritual as well as the natural. So why would God not want us to return and be forgiven? Okay, Because that's, that's kind of what this verse implies. is like, otherwise they'll turn and be forgiven. Okay, let me read another verse and then I'll bring, the, I'll bring all this together, okay? Matthew 18, 1 through 3, about that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? This is, this is a pretty, that's a pretty, it's a very powerful question. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Watch, this is so important. The, the truth of this really could change your life. Not because of me, but because it is, it, this is, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sin and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Unless Unless you turn from your sin and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So what is sin? Let me break this down just a little bit. What is sin? Sin is a word that simply means to miss the mark. Okay? If you have a bullseye, I didn't put a bullseye in here, but imagine a bullseye. A bullseye is dead center. Okay. Sin is to miss dead center. Sin is to miss the mark. What is the mark? The mark, basically the simplest way to explain the mark is, is God's law, God's standard, which Lewis actually talks about in the book. Um, it's the Ten Commandments. And most of us, I'm sure, know the Ten Commandments. If you don't, I encourage you to read them and read them honestly. 
Because if you will look at the Ten Commandments and you'll read them honestly, actually, I mean, the purpose of the Ten Commandments was to reveal to us God's standard. But another purpose of the Ten Commandments was to actually point us to Christ. In other words, if you look at the Ten Commandments honestly, you will, you will come to the conclusion that you have not kept those simple standards that God has established. Why? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Pretty simple. Okay? Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless you, unless you turn from that, unless you recognize that, you turn from your sin, become like a little child. Most children are very teachable. They're very open. They're very, they're like little sponges. Little kids are like little sponges. And it's why we should take care of them and watch over them. And um, he says, you'll never get into the kingdom of heaven. Now listen, I didn't say this. These are the words of Jesus. Here's that same verse in a different translation. Okay. This is the New American Standard. Um, so Jesus said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and you become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you are converted. Now follow me here for a second, because I was surprised by what I'm about to share with you. And maybe you will be surprised too. I, I didn't really, I mean, I know in generally what it means to be converted. But I looked up the original language. I love to do word studies. And so I love to study the original Greek and Hebrew. I love to study the original scriptures. Because they're so pictorial. They're languages that are very pictorial. They're very poetic. The word converted. This is awesome. I love this. Man, I hope, I hope this gets in you. I really do. Because this would convert you. If you will open your heart to what I'm about to say, if you're not converted. Here's the word. Strepho is the word. S-T-R-E-P-H-O. This is the Greek word. It means to turn around. That's why the other translation said to turn from sin. Okay. It means to come to believe. So to be converted... It isn't to become religious. It isn't to adopt a certain religion. Jesus didn't come to make us religious. Okay? Unless you define religion as the way God defines it. Okay? And I, and I, don't, I don't want to get into all that, but in James it says, pure and undefiled religion is to, to take care of widows and orphans and to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. That's religion that God accepts. God doesn't accept most religion. He really doesn't. A religion as we see it and have defined it is not what Jesus taught. Jesus didn't come to, to establish a religion. He came to redeem mankind and to, and to reestablish his family. So to come to believe, and that's really important because kids believe things really easily. And I'm not talking about, you know, just, just swallowing the pill Listen, if you've got questions, search out the question, search out the answer to those questions. You know, I'm not an apologist. I'm not like C.S. Lewis. I am who I am. But there is no question in my mind about the reality of God. None. I have questions about a lot of other things, but I, I don't to me atheism is foolishness. It's foolishness. To think that all this that we call the natural world just happened by accident. It's foolishness to me. And if you're offended by that, I'm sorry. I don't want to offend you. But I'm, believing is not making stuff up. Okay, Believing isn't making stuff up. It's opening your heart to spiritual realities. Okay, Now you can believe anything. People believe all kinds of crazy things. I'm talking about who Jesus is and what Jesus said. That's what I'm talking about. It means to change one's ways. I love this one. To be converted means to establish a relationship with. I love that. To be converted isn't to become religious. You don't have to become Presbyterian or Methodist or Catholic or whatever other thing. You don't. 
you have to establish a relationship. I love it. This is this is this is why I do these word studies, man. And I'm not going to apologize for being excited because this could change somebody's life. And I'm excited about anything that could change somebody's life for 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 Jesus's honor. To be converted means to establish a relationship. And listen, if you're listening to this, God God sent Jesus to suffer on a cross to establish a relationship with you. And the way you establish that relationship is you recognize that you need to establish that relationship. One more definition and then I'm going to go I'm going to hit the two very important things you have to do. This word strefo means change to cause something to turn into something else. I love that. To turn into something else. And this this actually this one is actually a good one for both Christians and non-Christians, okay? How is it good for Christians? Number 1 is it would help you to remember that you can't transform yourself. Romans 12:2 says be transformed. It's a command. How do I do that? You want to know how I do that? I offer myself to God. God does the transforming. He who began the good work in you, he will carry it on to completion. If he began a good work in you, he wants to carry it on. And C.S. Lewis nailed that in his book and talks about God's relentless desire to make us what he wants us to be. He's more committed to it than we are sometimes. Most of the time, actually. But this word strefo, to be converted, means to be to cause something to turn into something else. Only God can do that. You can't do that for yourself. Christian or non-Christian, you can't do that for yourself. Okay, so here's, for those of you who aren't Christians, and I hope there's some of you watching who are not Christians. Okay, here's what you got to do. Repent and believe. Repent and and believe. What does it mean? Let me go over this again. I think I did it in this already, but let me do it again. <clears throat> Repent is the is the Greek word metanoia, and it means a bunch of different things, but in essence what it means is it is a change of mind, a change of mind that leads to a change of life. One of the reasons why we don't open our heart in simple faith is because of this thing right up here. <laughs> we got 101 excuses. I'm not a bad person. This and that and the other thing. I hate to break it to you, but you are a bad person. Just like I was. Okay? You're a bad person just like I was a bad person. Okay? I was bad as a Christian. <laughs> and that's a whole different issue, but... If you think you're a good person, just honestly read the Ten Commandments. And then tell me if you're a good person, okay? All have fallen short. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Humanity is not good. We can learn good. We can live up to some measure of our own standard of goodness. But when it comes to God's standard, we've all missed it. Billy Graham missed it. Mother Teresa missed it. We've all missed it. And God knew that and he sent Jesus. So you got to repent and believe. What does it mean to believe? Now this is my definition. I'm not saying it's exclusive. But there's a big difference between knowing something here and knowing something here. To know something here is our minds do have a purpose in our relationship with God. But, but to believe something is a heart issue. It's a heart here. Every single one of us hold on to things in our heart that we believe are true, whether they're not, whether they are or not. Okay? Faith that saves you is an open heart that embraces what's true about Jesus, yourself, and what he did for you. Okay? So it's to embrace the truth of your own need, and this is just my definition. And the truth of Christ's provision. In other words, I'm the sinner. He's the Savior. I know that in my heart. 
and I come to him and say, Lord, I've fallen short. Forgive me of my sin. Okay. And I'm going to conclude with this because I have to keep this within 30 minutes. Romans 4. This is an amazing passage right here. Romans 4, 22 says, And because of Abraham's faith, now Abraham was the father of faith. And Abraham, I mean, it's amazing the story about Abraham and how he believed God in the, in the face of totally impossible circumstances. Um, and because of Abraham's faith, watch this really carefully. This is so good. God counted him as righteous. Because of what? Because he was good enough? Because he went to church five times a week? Because he did this right and that right? No. Because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too. Assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if, and there's the biggest, here's the biggest word in the Bible right here. If, I, F, if we believe, how do we believe? You got to be willing to change your thinking and open your heart. Listen, if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was handed over to die because of our sins, mine, yours, humanities. Because of our sin. And he was raised to life right here to make us right with God. So Jesus died because of our sins. He, he was raised to life so that we could have Zoe. Remember Zoe in the book? If you didn't, I encourage you to go back and read those chapters because they're awesome. Zoe is the life that God is. God possesses Zoe. We as humans possess bios, natural life. Zoe is God's life. To be born again is simply when, when bio, Zoe, God's life, comes in us. And when does that happen? That comes when we do this right here. When we open our hearts, we believe, we confess Jesus as Lord, Jesus said you would be born again. Unless you were born again, you cannot see the kingdom. Why? Because it's a spiritual kingdom and you don't see it with these things right here. You see it with the eyes of your heart. That comes by faith and trust. So if we believe him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. So, listen, wherever you're at, and I'm almost done here, okay? And let me just talk to anybody here who's watching this who's, you're not a Christian. You've never, you've never been born again. You've never seen your own need and that Jesus is the Savior. Um, I did this blog for you. I really did. Like, I didn't start it for you, but as I got into it, I thought, man, this is so good. I mean... Only God knows how many people have come to faith through C.S. Lewis's offering of mere Christianity. And so really all I was hoping to do was have some people take a fresh look at it. Because it, it's a book that will lead you right to Christ. So there it is, man. The truth has been laid out to you. And so will you repent and believe? Will you change your thinking? Will you recognize your own need of salvation? And will you receive Christ? And that door is open to you, okay? Um, for those of us who are Christians, I want to really encourage you, and this is my goal, and again, I'm, I apologize if, if you can't see the top word there, but this, uh, for some reason in my camera, it didn't come through well, I'm sorry. Um, embracing the mystery of God. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, there's always going to be a mystery to God. He's just so great. He's so outside of the natural realm that we're never going to be able to embrace all of it. I mean, listen, if, 
if you're the smartest guy in the world, whatever your field is, let's just say you're a rocket, you're a rocket or you're, you know, you're an astronomer. Can any astronomer know everything there is to know about the universe? No. If you can't know that and God created, how would you expect to know the fullness of the one who created it? We don't have the capacity to know God as he fully is. That's going to take eternity. But for those of you who are Christians, and I just pray that this whole series, I mean, this book is this book has stirred me probably more than any other book I've ever read outside of Scripture, and which is the reason I did this whole thing. And I, and it, I really believe it was the Holy Spirit who stirred me to do this. And so if you've made it this far, kudos. And God bless you, my brother or sister. And I pray that 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 whatever God wants to do in you, that you'll regain, like me, one of, the, one of the things that's happened as a result of this book is I feel like God has um, he's brought me back to some real childlikeness. Like, you know, I'm 54 years old, but in my heart there's some things that are just happening that are beautiful, actually. I mean, it's beautiful. When God works in us, it's beautiful. To him who began a good work, remember that it's a good work. At times, it's, it is hard and difficult, but it's good. And so I'm, I'm going to wrap it up right there. I, just, I do want to pray, though, because um, this has been a blast. I, and I encourage you, please share this with anybody and everybody you think would benefit from it. Um, and, you know, my blog thing is there. It, it worked out uh, to be 14 parts, <laughs> which is all good. Um, anyways, let me just pray real quick, and then I'm, then I'm done. And I hope... I hope wherever you are, you will be able to embrace the mystery and the beauty and the wonder of God. And so, Lord, I pray that. I thank you for whoever's watching this video. Lord, I pray for those who don't know you, I pray that you'd open their heart. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would chase them down. You would, in your kindness, lead them to the place of repentance to see that you are good and what you have already done for them, Lord. You've already paid for our guilt. You've paid for our guilt. You carried the weight of the guilt of humanity. That's, un that's unbelievable. That is impossible for us to comprehend as human beings. The fullness of what you carried on your shoulders. Lord, the physical pain was bad enough with the cross, let alone what you endured by carrying the sin of humanity. And so, Lord, I pray for those who watch this who don't know you. I pray in your kindness you would lead them to repentance and you would take my few loaves and fishes that I've offered here in this fresh look at mere Christianity and you would use it for your honor and glory. And for my brothers and sisters who are watching this, Lord, I pray that you would cleanse our imagination and you would rekindle a childlike thing within our hearts that we can be your children, even if we're older and have gray hair and not much hair like me, that we can recapture that childlike thing to where we wake up and we're just, we have an awe. You have inspired awe within our hearts because you are an awe-inspiring God. And I thank you for it and I praise you for it. Lord, thank you for Mr. Lewis and for what you gave to him because he had it, because you gave it to him. And may we continue to press on and love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, Lord, that our lives will have the impact that you desire it to be, the same way Lewis's life still has impact today. In August 7th, I think it is, of 2020, may you be honored and glorified through this all, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for going with me. I would love to hear from you. Please let me know. I'm on Facebook and all that good stuff. And have an awesome day.